They have some little eggs. They raise the little babies up, feed them until those little babies can squawk and flop and hop. And then it's able to feed itself. And it stays on the island and the parents leave. They come back to Hawaii and hang out on the beaches. And then, a year later, those birds that have never been to Hawaii start to fly and they fly to Hawaii. How'd they do that? Who showed them Hawaii 3,000 miles away across an ocean? Southwest doesn't fly that route, does it? No, Southwest does not fly that route. How did they figure that out? Instinct or a pineal gland. Okay, have you ever seen out by the river a bird that kind of looks like this? Maybe, maybe you'll recognize it. Let's see if I can make it. Have you ever seen a bird that kind of looks like this? It's on the water. Yep, a goose. So a Canadian goose. Canadian geese can fly all the way from Canada, all the way down to Mexico and back and find their way. How do they do that? Interestingly enough, what they found is inside their brains they also have a pineal gland. And that pineal gland is very, very concentrated with iron, which in essence creates for them a compass that always points a certain direction and gives them a directional sense as well as a seasonal sense. Okay? In our own brains, we have a pineal gland that says, I'm getting tired. It's time for me to go to bed. Okay? And we actually create what's called a circadian rhythm. The pineal gland actually has, beyond our five senses, the ability to say, night, night, or wake up. And when we push our brains and say, oh yeah, it's 10 o'clock, mom, don't worry about me. You and dad go to sleep. And now we're in there playing war, and my amygdala is saying, yeah, I'm going to stay up all night. Okay? And my hippocampus is getting smaller. My amygdala says, keep going, keep going, keep going. And my hippocampus is getting smaller. And my pineal gland is saying, but go to sleep. You're so tired. And I'd say, no, I can make it all night. And all of a sudden, morning comes. And now I'm so tired because I'm completely exhausted. And my cortisol levels went even higher. And now my hippocampus got even smaller. And my pineal gland is no longer regulating. I don't feel tired. I feel tired during the day. I come to school, and the teacher's talking. And I'm losing power. Okay, And I'm losing interest. I'm losing my ability to focus, and all of a sudden, it's not so interesting anymore, and learning becomes a bore, and learning becomes a chore, and learning becomes something for my parents to do, not me, right? Mom, I've got this assignment due. Hurry, do it for me, right? Nobody's guilty of that, I know, right? Hurry, Mom, hurry, Mom. you got to go get my swim trunks. I forgot them. How did you forget your swim trunks? I don't know. It just wasn't on my mind. Oh wait, that's frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is the one that says, organize your next day. Plan your next day. Be prepared. But if I'm thinking about or distracted by something else, now my frontal lobe doesn't take in the information correctly, and my circadian rhythm is off, and now my cycles get so imbalanced that I no longer have a cycle. And so like an orange clover, instead of flying to Hawaii where the sun and the beaches are nice, I end up just flying in a circle, and I just stay right where I am. Or the Canadian goose, I stay all winter up in Canada, or up in Alaska, and I freeze to death, right? So circadian rhythms are actually about survival. And our human expression and our human senses are about survival, but because we're human, we can actually enjoy life much more. So. What I'd like to just give to you tonight as a take home is how many of you can just close your eyes, not yet, okay? But close your eyes without falling asleep. Close your eyes, and I want you to focus on one thought, okay? And you're going to focus on one thought for 15 seconds. Try to just get one thought in your mind. And hold it for 15 seconds. I'll tell you when to stop. Close your eyes. 
and go. Stop. How many of you could actually hold one thought in your mind? Okay, a couple of you could. What did you think about? Food. Food? Rabbit. Rabbit goose, of course. A Canadian goose, of course. What else? What else did you think about in 15 seconds? The 15 seconds. The 15 seconds. Okay, anybody else? How many of you have ever watched TV? And as you're watching TV, actually watched an old movie with somebody, say, Charlie Chaplin. Remember Charlie Chaplin? Of course, again, we're going way back. Or, how about Shirley Temple? And those shows that are so slow, right? The next time you watch TV, observe how quickly they change scenes, okay? The maximum is 15 seconds. Why? Because the human brain can only retain a thought for 15 seconds, and then it's bored and it goes to the next thought, and it goes to the next thought, and it goes to the next thought, and it goes to the next thought. Amazing that the brain is constantly wanting to take in information through all of these feedbacks. But if we actually limit it to only sight and sound when we're watching a two dimensional image, all of a sudden we suppress that jumping ability, the gauging ability, and the ability to interact as humans. Okay? But just observe on the television how quickly they change the interaction. Okay? When we were kids, it was Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner. Now it's Phineas and Ferb, and you actually get all these different angles of Phineas and Ferb playing a guitar, whatever they do, right? It's so fast because on the Muppets program, what they realized is if they give you different angles or camera shots and change it every 15 seconds, they could actually hold the child's attention longer. They actually figured that out with the Muppets. Interesting, huh? And now all cinematography and television is actually done with that knowledge in mind. That your brain is changing thoughts every 15 seconds. And it's changing and moving and interacting in a different way to re-engage you and keep you there. Watch a commercial. Okay? A commercial is how long? Usually about 15 to 30 seconds. And it's going to give you four different camera angles in under 15 seconds. Because it knows that your brain is going to actually be distracted and lost, okay? So what we have to look at then is how can we actually create interaction for our brains that maintain attention and help us to be able to learn to protect our hippocampus and strengthen the amygdala and come back into our frontal lobes. Wow, that was a lot of information tonight, okay? What the challenge is then for all of us is Let's unplug for a bit from the need to immediately answer our cell phones or the need to an immediately answer a text message or an email as parents. There's a, a book by a, a fellow named Timothy Ferris called The Four Hour Week Work Week. Okay? I really like what he says about being efficient and effective. When he worked in Silicon Valley, he was working for one of the big software gurus down there. And what he found is every day he'd go in and sit in his cubicle and he'd start to type. Okay? As soon as he'd open his computer, he would have a prompt, you've got mail, you've got email, you've got email, you've got email. And so he'd start to answer all of his emails. And he said by the end of the day, he was an expert at putting all of his emails into files. How many of you are really good at putting your emails into files? <laughs> Raise your hands if you're really good at that, okay? A few organizers that love to put their emails into files, right? He said the other thing he was really good at, he could return all of his text messages. So he'd pick up his phone and get all of his text messages returned. As soon as they'd come in, boom, he'd write, write on his text message. And then the next thing that would happen, he'd get a call. So he'd answer his calls, and then he'd return his email, and then he'd go back to his text message. Then he'd answer his phone. And all of a sudden, at the end of the day, he realized he had a whole stack of important things that needed to be done that never even got touched, okay? <laughs> And so he said, in order to be more effective and efficient, he put a prompt on his email that said, Hi, you reached Timothy Ferris. I check my emails at noon and 4 o'clock. Please, if this is an emergency, contact this person. He put a note on his door, Please knock if this is an emergency. Otherwise, I'll be out of my office at noon and 4 o'clock. 
please let me finish my work to be more effective and efficient. And then he said on his emails and his text messages, hi, you're Timothy Ferris, I check my email, or excuse me, my text message and my phone calls at 2, excuse me, 12 and 4. Please leave me a message, I'll get back to you then. Okay? Guess what he found? Guess what he found? What do you think he found by doing that? He was more efficient and effective. That's exactly right. And by doing that, he actually got through his whole case of files and actually started to become more creative in his business to the point where he actually moved on and created his own business. And in order to be more effective and efficient, he realized that he didn't have to always be ready to answer the phone or answer the text message or answer the email. Okay? Because if the person actually needed to talk to him, they would have called, right? Email doesn't, just because it goes bing on your phone, doesn't mean I need an answer right now, right? And especially mothers with amygdalas at the expense of the child who's right there interacting with you in the moment, all right? And for us dads, for our children to be able to understand that there's a time, okay? So challenge parents. 